Welcome to episode 15 of the Camera Shake podcast, the podcast all about photography, videography, anything to do with cameras and all that kind of stuff. If you can hold a camera, this is the podcast for you. Now, if you've joined us last week for episode 14, then you probably know by now that this is actually a double episode that we've been filming because Nick, being a lazy what's it, is taking some time off next week because you're going to Devon, right? I am for a whole seven days. Hey. Hey. In actual fact, as you'll be watching this episode right now, he's probably going to be sunning himself on some Devon Beach. I oh, thought. that's true. I'll be halfway through my uh, my week then. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. So now how is this episode going to get edited though? That's the question. I'm going to work double hard this week. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> cool. Now we've got a number of stories for you this week. So let's get cracking. Okay, so have you got any other interesting stories for this week? Yeah, I um, I mean, well, it's not an interesting story as such, but you know me, I, if I come across a simple explanation for something when people are learning and I wish I'd seen when I was originally learning, hmm. yeah, I, love, I love that stuff. You know, if, if someone can explain something in ways that you can understand immediately, wins mm. as far as i'm concerned cool. and i was just reading about this um, photographer called robert hall and he's done a quick video on how um using water to describe what aperture is shutter speed is iso is okay um what um you know having a flash w might might be like with with water and it's it's really really interesting. Oh, and modifiers too. Oh, They're right. really really interesting. It's used water for the entire thing. I, w I won't go for it all, but it's it's worth worth checking out. Cool. So it's it's things like um, you know he, he's literally laid out three glasses. Mm -hmm. He's put he calls it a, a spoon of water in one, mm. and he puts two spoons of water in another, and he puts four spoons of water in another, and that's one stop. Oh, There's right. a stop difference between it. It just cool. doubles each time. It's very Simple and straightforward. He goes on to talk about shutter speed and how that's like turning on a tap and how long that tap is open for. Mm -hmm. Aperture, it's how how open that tap is. So the amount of light it can actually right. take take in. Um, and then for, for ISO, and it's probably not strictly true, but if you're learning, it gives you the right kind of idea. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as you crank your ISO, it's like, you know, say, I say 100, that's just a full glass of water. Mm. Um, you know, a higher ISO, put an ice cube in it, that represents noise. Right, okay. That's the it. higher the ISO goes, the more no more ice cubes go in it. Right, okay. The I more see. noise okay, well, it becomes less. It. It's not entirely accurate, obviously, but no. it it gives you at least, if, if I was learning that, it would give me, oh, okay, it's mm. getting me on the right, right track. Yeah. And then the other one which I found interesting was um, like having a flash, is like having an extra glass of water over to the side, mm. ready to go at any point just to dump into the glass. Yeah. And just fills fills with light. And then the other one was the um like a diffuser. It's a bit like um putting a piece of cloth over the glass and then pouring the water in. <laughs> okay. You know, it's little things like yeah. that. And it's it's all very basic. But when you're starting out, mm. this stuff is it takes a little while to grasp it. Hmm. And if there's any other way, any anecdote, um, not anecdote, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, beer. <laughs> <laughs> Why does this word escape me? I, I don't know. If there's another way to explain something, yeah, then that is more um, normal for you to understand. Uh, is every more something that's more every day for you? Yeah. That's good. Yeah. That's good. It gets you there. It really helps mm. you to start understanding a little bit. Well, I mean, we, we can take the uh, exposure triangle um, mm -hmm. apart, um, maybe for some of our viewers, especially if you know, for those um, for those of you who have uh, just gotten into photography. Um, I think we can we can talk about the exposure triangle. Um, so the exposure triangle is made up of three components: mm -hmm. is shutter speed, aperture, and ISO. Are you an ISO man or an ISO man? I think I'm an ISO man. See, I think I'm an ISO man. Yeah. Not really sure. We've with... had this with Boca and Bokeh. Okay, and... yeah. Mm, yes. Very true. Mm. Mm. Anyway, so, um, yeah, I guess it would be ISO, though. 
Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah, because ISO is just a norm. You know, it doesn't mean anything other than mm. it's a sort of standard norm type of thing. Um, so, in a, in a nutshell, shutter speed is pretty self-explanatory. It's basically how fast your shutter opens and closes. Yeah. Um, aperture is the little iris inside of your lens, and um, the the size of the aperture basically matters because obviously a, a wider aperture lets more light in than a smaller aperture. Mm -hmm. So so that also matters. Um, and the ISO or ISO is basically the sensitivity of your sensor. Mm -hmm. So in the olden days, you used to have different types of film. And so you'd have very sensitive film and not so sensitive film. And depending on what kind of conditions you would um, shoot under, like for instance, if you, if you um, if you were to shoot at a beach in bright sunlight, you would really need film that's not very sensitive because there'd be a lot of light around anyway. But if you were shooting at nighttime, then you would need a more sensitive film. And so that's exactly what um, ISO ISO does um, on your DSLR or mirrorless camera. As you crank that up, you literally crank up the sensitivity of your sensor. So the whole idea in photography is that we need to basically get light to the sensor in order to expose an image. Mm -hmm. And these three elements in our exposure triangle allow us to regulate the amount of light that will let through to the sensor, right? So for instance, again, shutter speed, the longer the shutter stays open, the more light can pass through the shutter. And the shorter it stays open, the more we limit the amount that we let through. The aperture kind of does the same thing. The wider the aperture is, the more light can pass through, and the narrower it is, yeah. the we limit it. And then um, the ISO, or ISO, since it regulates the sensitivity, um, that basically will just simply mean that you know we can expose uh, if if the ISO is high and the the sensor is very sensitive, uh, we need less light to expose an image on that. Yeah. Kind of makes sense. So. Each one of those three elements also has a secondary effect or a side effect, if yep. you want. So, and, th and this, when I was learning, was the hardest thing for me to get my head around. Yeah, and it was—it's uh, exactly what you're—you know—you're going to go on to say, and yeah. it's understand. Well, why isn't you just? Why can't it all just be set the same? Yeah, because I think everybody thinks it's like, what's the point? Why, yeah. You know, why can't we just? Have one thing that says, like, you know, that, that allows us to regulate the amount of light and then be done with it. Mm. So I think everybody's seen two different types of photographs. So the first type of photograph is the kind of photograph where fast movement of fast action has been frozen. Like, for instance, where you can see a raindrop or raindrops in the air, or, um, you know, take a, a sports photograph, like a football match or something, you know, where you have a ball frozen in the air. So these these movements are fast movements and they've been frozen. So you get a razor sharp image of the ball stuck in the air. Um, and then the other type of photograph is the kind of photograph where we have so-called motion blur. For example, where we can see a ball, let's stick with a football game, and you can see the trail of the ball. Or uh, you can imagine photographs where um, you can see cars driving through mm -hmm. um, the photo and you can see the light trails of their headlights, you know, or taillights, for example. So these are all, um, these are all photographs where uh, we can see motion happening at a time. And as a photographer, you basically make a decision as to whether you want to see motion or you don't, whether you want to freeze something or whether you want to allow that motion to be visible in the photo. So this is one of the, one of many, but, quite an important decision that you make as a photographer. And remember I said each one of the three components in the uh, uh, in the exposure triangle has a side effect. So the side effect, as far as shutter speed is concerned, is motion blur. Mm -hmm. So if you, if you use a fast shutter speed, meaning the shutter only stays open for a very short amount of time um, and then immediately shuts again, that allows you to freeze motion. So if you have something that moves very fast, it allows you to freeze that um, and you get a very sharp image. Um, so that means we're letting in just a very small amount of light because our shutter just stays open for a very short amount of time. On the contrary, if we want to 
if we really want to depict that motion trail, then we need to leave the shutter open for longer. So we need to use a slower shutter speed. So therefore, the shutter stays open for longer. Um, but what happens now is that more light passes through the shutter. So what that means is, is that we need to regulate that amount of, of light somewhere else. We need to compensate for need to compensate. the changes in that. Yes, the exactly. We need to compensate with, with something else because otherwise we might overexpose the image. Mm -hmm. So we may want to, for example, reduce the sensitivity of the sensor. Could be one way of doing it. Or we may want to use a smaller aperture or both to basically compensate for that amount of light that now passes through the shutter because we've decided we want to see the motion trail and therefore we've decided to, to leave the shutter open. So shutter speed basically um, regulates the amount of motion that we see. So we can freeze motion or we can you know, allow motion blur to happen. So that's cool. And then when we look at aperture, remember the aperture is that iris inside of your, your camera lens. Mm -hmm. And you can open that really wide and you can close it and make it really small. So the side effect of aperture is depth of field. So depth of field means, depth of field is essentially the area that is in focus on your uh, in your photo. So for example, uh, take a typical portrait kind of shot, where let's say the person's face is in focus from the tip of the nose to the back of the head. Mm -hmm. And the background is super smoothly blurred out. So what that means is, is that the person's head is in focus, but everything behind the head has been thrown out of focus. And what that does is creatively, I mean, it does, what it does is it's, it focuses the attention on the subject, right? Right. So there are no distractions from anything that's happening in the background. That's kind of, that's very often what you want as a portrait photographer is you want to draw all the attention to the subject, but there may be situations where you don't want that. But in order to blur the background out and to keep the depth of field really narrow, you need to shoot with a wide open or a very, very wide aperture. So the wider the aperture, the smaller or the narrower the depth of field is. Mm -hmm. uh, you find it very often in like, uh, in some very modern kind of headshots, for example, yep. where you really focus on the eye. You always focus on the, on the eye. Uh, and you may see that even the tip of the nose is already out of focus. So the depth of field may just go from, you know, the, the tip of the eyelash to just behind the ears. It's just really a thin slither, if you want. And then the ears already fall off into uh, in, into out of focusness and the tip of the nose out of focus. So some, some uh, you, know, you see that in some very kind of modern style um, kind of headshots. Um, but again, there may be situations where you want the foreground, the mid-ground, and the background to be perfectly in focus. And one example of that would be landscape photography, for example. You imagine you have, you know, mountains in the background, you've got, I don't know, a vehicle or stuff or trees or whatever mm -hmm. in the mid-ground and some stuff happening in the foreground. You want all of these things to be in focus. Then you need a very, a very wide depth of field. In order to achieve that, you need to really make your, your aperture smaller. And funnily enough, uh, in photography, what you'll find is that the smaller the number, the wider the actual hole in the iris. That took me so long to remember. Yeah, there's, there's a reason for that, which uh, I'm not going to get into because it's no. a bit too complicated. <laughs> but um, but that's just it's just the thing to remember is that it's kind of counterintuitive. Right? Yeah. So if you shoot at a very wide aperture, the number is very small. So it could be 1.8 or even 1.4 or in some of the... Um, so the newer lenses, um, and especially with the new uh, mirrorless mounts, you know, 1.2 even, um, those are very wide open um, apertures. And very often, the wider your aperture can be in a lens, the more expensive the lens is going to be. Mm -hmm. right? so that's, that's very often the case. Um, and then on the other side of the spectrum, you've got apertures of F. This is the F numbers we're talking about, by the way, just for clarification. So F11, F16, F22, those are very small apertures. And again, if you want to create a really wide depth of field, then, then that's what you need. Um, the smaller the hole, as it were, the less light you're letting through. So again, you need to compensate 
um, elsewhere. And this could be with shutter speed, or it could be with the third component, which is ISO or ISO. So remember, ISO determines the sensitivity of your sensor. And that sounds great, because it means that if you know less light is available, you can just crank up the sensitivity of your sensor, and you can expose mm -hmm. an image. Great. The side effect, the negative side effect of ISO is noise. So the, the higher you crank the sensitivity of your sensor, the more noise you'll introduce into the image. Um, and in the, old, in the olden days of film, that used to be known as film grain. Uh, now we just it's just digital noise. It doesn't look quite the same. No. It's not quite as pleasing, but um, digital noise, well, it's sort of a similar effect anyway. Intuitively, you would think, well, why would anybody want a noisy picture? It doesn't make any sense, right? But there may be situations where you might actually be able to live with the noise because, for example, let's take a, um, a concert type of situation. Let's say you're shooting a concert. Uh, lighting conditions are always tricky at a concert because, you know, there usually isn't a lot of light or lights changing all the time. So you often have to shoot at high ISOs. So the higher the ISO number, the more sensitive the sensor and the more noise you'll introduce. So just as an example, the base ISO, which is of the minimum ISO um, in a lot of DSLRs, is around about 100. Mm -hmm. So ISO of 100 is basically that will give you a not very sensitive sensor, but a really clean image. And that's great. For instance, in fashion photography or with portraits, uh, studio photography is a thing, you really want to get as clean an image as possible. Fantastic. Or product photography, something like that. Um, but in a concert situation, you may have to crank that ISO number up to 1600, 3200, 6400, something like that. You'll get a lot more noise. What you'll be able to do, though, is you'll be able to keep the shutter speed, for example, at, um, at a rate where you can get a sharp image. And I always, whenever I shoot concerts, I always live by, by this one thought. I'd rather have a sharp image that's noisy than a clean image that's blurry because my shutter speed was open too long. No question. That's it, you know? So, um, so as far as the ISO is concerned, like I said, the negative side effect is noise, but there are situations where you can, where yeah. you can live with that. Um, I'll tell you one really useful um, ISO-related fact in a studio, for example, is when you work with artificial lights, especially when you work with speed lights. So I've done this for, for many years. I, I used to go out and do headshots um, just using a set of speed lights. Now, with speed lights, the problem is they're battery powered. And of course, mm. the problem with batteries is they run out after a certain amount of, of shots, right? Um, now, if you can half the power on your speed light, you get double the amount of shots. It's as simple as that. If you can, you know, if you can quarter the power, you'll get four times as many shots. So by increasing the ISO on your camera, you can decrease the power on your speed light and therefore get more shots out of your speed light. Mm -hmm. Now with modern cameras, and remember every time you double the number, your ISO number, you're basically um, you're basically doubling the sensitivity of the, of the yeah. sensor. So if you go from 100 to 200, from 200 to 400, 400 to 600. Now, with modern cameras, I really I really think that if you... It's, it's barely noticeable. I think most people would not be able to notice the, dis, the difference between ISO 400 and ISO 100. But ISO 400 is two stops more sensitive. Right. Meaning that... I can, for instance, I could switch my speed light from full power to quarter power. So that would give me four times as many shots on my speed light yep. with absolutely negligible loss in quality in the final in the final product. So so you know that's one very, very useful approach to ISO um, when it comes to your your light power. Um, so that's yeah, so that's that's basically what ISO does. Now the good news for people who are learning is that, um, again, most modern DSLRs have a number of different modes. So you have fully automatic mode, where the camera makes all the decisions, to manual mode, where you make all the decisions. 
but there are a number of semi-automatic modes in between. So for example, you'd have something like shutter priority on Nikon or um, aperture priority. So what that means is, is that you set one aspect of the exposure triangle and the camera takes care of the rest. And so te it's te technically not entirely true unless you set the ISO to auto ISO. Correct. Right. But let's let's for argument's sake, let's say you've set the uh, ISO to auto, so the camera determines the automatically uh, what ISO it should be, and then you use one of the um, one of the semi-automatic modes. Then what that means is all you got to do is decide on what shutter speed you wanna you wanna use, and then the camera does the rest. And what it does is it frees up your brain power because all you've got to think about is what effect do I want to create? Remember shutter speed? We talked about this. It's it's, it determines whether you want to, it basically allows you to freeze an object or to uh, introduce motion blur. So for instance, you can take a picture and you, before you take the picture, you decide whether you want to freeze something or whether you want to have motion blur. Let's say for instance, you want to take some pictures at night. Um, you're, you want to take some pictures of moving cars and you want to see the light trails of the headlights or the, uh, the taillights of that car. Then if you want to see those light, ta uh, light trails, then you need to, um, use a slower shutter speed. Um, so that's a creative decision that you make because you could decide, for instance, that you want to freeze those cars, right? And again, that would basically then mean that you'd have to sh um, use a, a faster shutter speed. But you don't have to worry about anything else because you don't have to worry about balancing everything off. The camera does the rest. It's a really good way of learning. Same thing with um, aperture priority. You know, you take a, um, a photo of, you know, your kid or your or a friend or whatever, and you decide whether you want the background to be in focus or not. You know, or you take a picture of a landscape or something like that, and you decide how much of that you want. For instance, you know, you could take a picture of a flower, and again, you decide whether you know you want to blur out the the background or not. So, so these are creative decisions that you make as a photographer, um, and the camera would never would never be able to make these decisions for you because the camera doesn't know what you want to achieve creatively. You know, that's the, that's the thing. Yeah. Um, auto mode on a camera basically means simply that, that the camera measures the available light and it basically takes a photo, balancing things off so that everything is perfectly exposed, meaning that nothing's too dark, nothing's too light. Great. But the camera can't make the creative decisions for you because the camera will never know whether you want a slow, a, a slow, a slow, <laughs> slow shutter speed. <laughs> slow, I can't talk. You haven't even started drinking. Uh, I know. Slow, such, slow. Yeah, wow. <laughs> slow shutter speed, or whether you know, or whether you want to freeze that car, for example. Yeah. You know, um, uh, same thing with um, you know, same thing with the with the aperture. Um, the camera just won't know whether you you know whether you want the background to be in focus or not it's interesting when you look at an iphone for example so take pictures with an iphone and what you notice is generally speaking you have a very wide depth of field mm -hmm. generally speaking when you take a picture of somebody the um the background will be more or less in focus unless you use something called portrait mode which digitally imitates that bokeh or bokeh, right? So that's the blurry background. Um, and so what, what the what the iPhone does is it basically figures out, okay, this is the subject, so we're going to keep that in focus and everything else yeah. we digitally blur out. So this is really a digital effect. Yeah. Um, but you'd have to still manually switch that to portrait mode for that to happen. Mm -hmm. You know, the phone doesn't make that decision for you. You make the decision as a photographer. And I, in my mind, I always, I always think, that's the difference for me. That's the difference between a photograph and a snapshot. A yeah. photograph is something where you as a photographer make conscious creative decisions as to how you want the end result to be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And a snapshot is something where you just press the shutter button and you just take a picture. And I'm not saying one's better than the other. I'm just saying that in my mind, that's kind of, that's how I see it. Anyway, that's how, that's how I see the difference. And sometimes, sometimes you want to make conscious decisions because you want to create something, you see something in your mind and you want to create a photo or you want to draw the attention to something specific in a photo or whatever. 
And sometimes you just want to take a picture. Like if you're on a family holiday and you're with the kids, you just want to take a picture, you know, so you set your camera to auto and it's all good. Yeah. You know, that's perfectly cool. Um, but that's not a, a crafted photograph. That's yeah. a different, it's a different thing. It is you different. Know? So, um, so the art of photography in a sense is to, to get a handle on the exposure triangle and, and the secondary effects so these side effects, and then utilize, utilize your skill to basically create a photo the way you want it to be. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, it's like the, the whole shooting with intent kind of thing. Where mm -hmm. you, mm -hmm. um, you have a certain intention and then you execute that. And the better you get and with practice, it's like everything else. Um, you know, with practice and putting yourself into different situations and practicing on different subjects and objects and whatever else, you know, you'll, you'll get a feel for, you know, what, what does aperture, uh, what does F 5.6 look like? What does F8 look like? What does F16 look like? What does F2.8 look like? You know, um, how, because the thing about depth of field, for instance, is um, there are a number of things that, in fact, that it d determine the actual depth of field. One is the distance from a subject and the focal length. So just to give you an example, um, uh, as a portrait photographer, especially when you do headshots, what you very often do is you use a longer focal length. So for instance, um, and let's say I would use like a 70 to 200 millimeter lens, and it'd be probably somewhere in the region of like 160 to 200. And I'll be at a certain distance from the subject. And what it does is at that focal length, if I shoot at about 3.5, somewhere around there, maybe not quite 2.8, but somewhere around anyway, 3.2 3 even, um, then I know that I get a certain depth of field, like for instance, from the tip of the nose to just behind the ear or something like that. Um, and I know that the uh, the background will be nicely out of focus, and and at that focal length, it also compresses the background a little bit, so it kind of almost moves the background closer to the subject visually. Um, so you'll see less of the background. So if you're shooting in front of, a, you know, a backdrop, for example, that could be important. Um, if you shoot with a slightly wider lens, like I also like to use an eighty-five, um, then I know that I have to be closer to the subject to get the same effect. Um, but the background compression won't be quite the same. So I'll actually see more of the background in the in the photo than I would have ordinarily otherwise shooting with the other lens. Mm -hmm. So it's just a matter of then again making a decision as to what kind of look you like. You know. So I think really the only way you'll you'll get your head around these things is by practicing. And you can practice on anything. I mean you could take two cups, you know, and you could um you kind of position them at different distances and use a particular um, aperture and take a shot and then kind of move, move them back and forth and stuff. Almost word for word, exactly what I did when I first started yeah. learning is to keep a couple of different objects in different places and to yeah. see what it did. And for instance, in this case, you know, you would, you could use something, uh, something called aperture priority, which basically means again, you decide, you determine the aperture mm -hmm. and the camera does the rest for you. Um, and you know, the interesting thing about these semi-automatic uh, modes is, is that, People, especially in the beginning, people often think like, oh, okay, so once I, once I get to the point where I can handle manual, I'll always shoot a manual, right? And nothing could be further from the truth because, <laughs> because some of these uh, semi-automatic uh, modes are very, very useful yeah, they are. under certain circumstances. Like for instance, I'll give you an example. Um, somewhere where you have rapidly changing lighting conditions. Mm -hmm. So a little while ago, I shot a festival and it was outdoors and um, the, the sky was, it was kind of, it was cloudy. So it was like, it, there was some sun and some clouds. It wasn't totally overcast, but it was constantly changing. Sometimes, you know, it'd be a bright sunshine and mm -hmm. a couple of seconds later, it'd be a cloud in front of the sun and it would constantly be, be, uh, be changing. So um, I shot that in shutter speed priority. And what that allowed me to do was it basically allowed me to determine my shutter speed and whether I wanted to freeze yep. the, uh, the, you know, the, the actual movements, like the, the musicians playing an instrument, whether I wanted to see movement or not. Like with, just imagine if somebody plays the guitar, there's a lot of movement in the right hand usually. 
And so you, you basically make a conscious decision as to when you, whether you want to freeze that hand or whether you want to see the the movement in there. Um, and I could do that because the camera would make all the other decisions for me at that point based on the available light at that moment. Yep. Had I shot that in manual, I would have missed just about every other shot because the because literally you take one shot, there'd be a cloud. You take another shot, there'd be no cloud. Yeah, and it would just constantly be changing like that. So in a, in a situation like that, it does make sense to use um, a semi-automatic mode. I know a lot of um, a lot of photographers who who like to shoot an aperture priority mode because it essentially just means that you determine the the depth of field that you want, and the camera does the rest for you. Um, I shot some boxing matches um, a little while ago, an indoor in an indoors arena, and um, that was actually that was quite a complicated shoot because um, the lighting was challenging and there was a lot of fast movement going on. Uh, and low light situations with fast movement is pretty much the worst combination that you can imagine because you um, there's a limit to what you can do with your shutter because. Yeah. You introduce motion blur, and especially with a boxing match, you do want to freeze things a lot. Um, but everything else keeps changing around you. So, um, so shutter speed priority really kind of works in that, in combination with auto ISO, for example, because you just you need to have a little bit more kind of playing room, if yeah. that makes sense. Um, so, so these semi-automatic modes, you know, are very useful. Sometimes, but mm. I think specifically when it comes to to learning about the exposure triangles, you know, it's brilliant. I think they're the most important modes to use when you're first, mm. very first learning, and you, you may not stay on them for very long because you just you you get it. But you know, yeah. I'm quite I'm quite technic technical technically minded, sorry, yeah. and obviously not language minded, yeah. and <laughs> it took me the the longest time to get my head around it. And then yeah. one day it all just kind of slotted in. And then I'm, mm. that was the point where I knew, right, it's time to get into manual. Cause now I'm, I'm at my limit of what I could do, yeah. what I wanted to be able to do with aperture and shutter priority. You know how, you know how I learned, I, I actually learned a manual. And you know why? Because, because the camera was set to M to manual. And I really, I literally had no idea what the other things meant. And so I didn't change them. <laughs> ah, nice. <laughs> and so um yeah, so I, I learned yeah, I learned, I learned I there is learn. a side effect. I generally noticed I don't I don't use shutter aperture priority too often, but I do use them in situations like you just described actually. Mm -hmm. Um or where I'm oh, also where I'm feeling perhaps a little bit lazy as well. Sure. You know. But the, the side effect I always noticed was that, you know, I'd also have ISO in auto too, because it just made sense while I was learning shutter. And I always found that my camera would tend to favor bumping up the ISO yeah. Yeah, absolutely. than doing something with the shut, uh, doing something yeah. with the aperture. Right. Cool. Um, it would always leave, depending on whether you're in shutter or aperture priority mode, it would always leave the aperture or the shutter speed in a middle ground yeah, would. and then pump, bump up the ISO. Yeah, so that's the way you get around it is by setting limits for your, for your ISO. Yeah, which I didn't know about at yeah. the time. So I, I learned that when I was, um, I shot a boxing match, like I said earlier, and uh, I, I was, um, shooting that with another photographer who's uh, very experienced in shooting, especially boxing matches, mm. and so uh, that's the one thing I learned from him was to set the correct limit on the on the auto ISO. Yeah. Um, and because I kind of I went into it thinking like a concert photographer, so I kind of thought of it like I would shoot a concert. This is like a, it's a very long evening with loads of matches going on, there were two rings, and it just went on forever. And I think so sort of halfway through the first match i realized that this wasn't really working as well as i thought it would and the situation was somewhat different from shooting a concert so then then having a ch having had a chat with the other photographer i kind of you know i i sort of uh, compared his setup to, uh, to the way i my, my camera set mm -hmm. and i have to say i tried out his kind of ballpark and his settings and it worked a lot better and it kind of made sense under the circumstances so the thing about um auto iso is is that you you can on most cameras you can set a limit so you can set an upper limit um, sometimes even maybe a lower limit I don't know but um, anyway on my camera you can set an upper limit and so what that means is your camera will um, set the ISO automatically up to a certain point yeah so that upper limit really depends it, it will differ from camera to camera because uh, for instance um, 
you know, on, on my camera, I know I can, I can pump her up to 6,400 and still be somewhat happy with that. But I also have you know, another camera, for instance, where I know that 3,200 is the absolute maximum. Yeah. Like 1,600 yeah. would probably be like the upper limit I would, I would use in that, but that's, that is about it. And that limit's getting ever higher as cameras improve, right? Yeah, it's true. Yeah. Anyone? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, obviously because, um, sensors get better to get, you know, technology moves on. So, um, in fact, I mean, even, you know, if, even, sh- I mean, shooting at ISO 1600, when I shoot concerts, is nothing, you know, 3200 is where I live. So, you know, somewhere around that, um, you speak to some people and they go like, 1600 that's crazy <laughs> because not too long ago it would have been unthinkable to to shoot in anything higher right. than 800 right and so technology has moved on in leaps and bounds you know only like even only over, over the last like 10 years or something in, in how um low noise cameras are these days and this is like really from from camera generation to camera generation you find that you know the the uh, low the low light performance so with the iso performance gets better and better with every yeah. generation and it's you know modern really you know modern cameras nowadays can really handle relatively high isos i mean there is no excuse for shooting at twelve thousand six hundred or something like that i'm not even sure why that exists what's the point who's well, ever going to use it okay so here's the thing right so on my fuji i have i use auto iso quite a lot on my fuji actually sure and i've set it up so that i have three different auto iso settings mm-hmm. um so the first one goes up to 400, the second one goes up to 1600, I think, and the third one goes up to 12,600, 12, whatever, 12, 12, 5 or something like that. Um, or maybe just the middle one goes up to 3200, something like that. And that's because I use that camera in a very different way from the way I would use my Nikon. So my my Fuji, I use, you know, street, uh, like to do street photography, for example, or take it you know, when, when I go somewhere with the kids or something like that. Mm. So I want to make less decisions with that camera. I don't want to make all the decisions all the time because it's, I have to shoot like from the hip and sometimes, you know, especially in, in street photography, you get to be relatively quick. There's just no time to fiddle around and, you know, change settings left, right and center. So there's, there's certain sort of, um, scenarios where I rely on the, on the camera to make the right decision. And so depending on what kind of lighting situation i'm in like if i'm outdoors and the sun is shining i use my auto iso setting one which is which limits it at 400 and then if i'm indoors um i set it to auto iso setting number two which is like whatever 3200 whatever it is and then if it's really dark in the evening or something outside and it's nighttime or whatever i set it to setting number three which is like 12,000, whatever and so i just tell the camera to, to use different upper limits depending on what situation I'm in. Mm-hmm. And that's it. Then then I don't have to really worry about that. Mm-hmm. And that's really like two flicks with my with my thumb and I can change it from one setting to the other. So so auto ISO limits kind of come in very handy depending on the, depending on what it is that you're doing and what situation you're in. Yeah. Um so on one hand, modern cameras are really good at making decisions. But they're going to be very it's fairly technical decisions. You know, the the creative they can never make the creative decisions for you. This no. is what I'm trying to say. Um, and again, just you know, although albeit I might be in danger of repeating myself, um, in order to learn photography, it's it's really really crucial to get a handle on this exposure triangle, mm-hmm. and you know, get to the point where you can where can you can look at a scene. You can make the creative decisions that you want, that you need to make, or that you want to make, and then, then get the machine to execute what you what you creatively see. You know that's the this thing. And and at that point, you know your camera just becomes a tool like any other tool. Like you know it becomes your hammer if you're a carpenter, or you know um, your I don't know I don't know tool if you're some other tool worker <laughs> wow <laughs> right. couldn't come up with another one <laughs> well, no. yeah exactly you know i mean it becomes your paintbrush essentially if you're a painter you know so that's what i'm trying to say it's basically um you just you know you need I, I think as a photographer you need to get to the point where you are in control of 
of of the machine that takes the picture, not the other way around. Because otherwise, it really is the camera that dictates to you what the yeah. episode is. So, anyway, that's all. Uh, I'll be honest. I didn't expect this to go quite there when I started talking about water. <laughs> 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 See, in this episode, you've actually learned something, everyone. <laughs> 45 minutes later. <laughs> Woo. Um, that's fun because it's, um, you know, I think we we and Ed, you know, anyone else who's been doing it for a long time take a lot of this stuff for, for granted and, and forget it too, you know. And you you do forget how how difficult it can be when you're first learning this stuff. It's so confusing. Totally. So, so confusing. Absolutely. So any little bit of help that you can get from your camera and by using those semi-automatic modes is is well worth it i mean even you know even when it comes to fully automatic mode there is a you know, there, there is there are situations especially when you're learning where you, you you're perfectly happy you can be perfectly happy using fully automatic for, for example um so one of the we've just we've been talking about the sort of technical aspects of of creating a photograph like determining the depth of field and mm -hmm. motion freeze or blur you know and all that kind of stuff what we of course haven't talked about is composition so composition is the other aspect of a photo is like where things are placed in the frame um that really doesn't have anything to do with your camera setup per se it's basically a decision that you make as a photographer as to how you frame your shot um now when you practice composition you can really free yourself from all the technical stuff, for example, and just set the camera to fully automatic. No problem at all. Yeah, and absolutely. And then, you know, then you don't have to worry about any of that other stuff, but you can just focus on composition. Mm -hmm. and, and in many ways, um, I think that it's it's worth pointing out that that could very well be the very first thing that you do on your journey into photography. It's just no worry about all the technical stuff and just literally just think about what am I taking a photo of? And where do I want that to be in the frame? You know, and just start start with, start there. And arguably the most important thing about any photograph, right? <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah. But but again, it's it's all of these, all of these aspects in tandem that make a great photograph, yeah. you know. And, and it's um it's interesting, actually, when you, uh, I don't know if you've ever been to, to a camera club uh, competition. And it's interesting when you listen to the judge take apart well, not take it apart, but uh, when you listen to a judge talk about the uh, the photographs, mm. um, so typically the way uh, a competition would work, you know, there'd be a series of photographs, and it'd be either um, digitally pro projected or in print, and the judge would make comments about that particular photograph and then give it a mark, right? Um, and the the judge's comments are really a great source of learning, right? Because For sure. Usually, well, typically, most of the time, pretty much all the time, you know, um, a competition judge would be a very experienced photographer, and mm -hmm. they, you know, they'll see things and they point things out that maybe, maybe that weren't necessarily very, very obvious to you uh, in, in the first place. And especially when you're learning, it's really, really useful. Sometimes these kind of comments have to be taken with a pinch of salt because sure. they're yeah. very often very subjective, you know, um, but. Nevertheless, they can be very useful, um, you know, especially when, I don't know, you know, if you look at a photograph and you think, like, oh, that's a really nice tree, until somebody points out that the highlights are blown out or the shadows are um, too dark or whatever, something else, or the, or the tree would, you know, be nicer or better if it was slightly further to the left because there's too much space there and this and then the other. And when you, when you start looking at it like this, you kind of go, oh, yeah, that's right. Oh, yeah, that's true. So it very, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a really... Again, it's a great way of learning um, just by listening to somebody else yeah. talk about a photograph and making right. suggestions. There's ultimately what judges do, they make suggestions. Um, and and so, yeah, so coming back to the fully automatic mode. So in a situation like that, perfectly usable. Again, I use uh, fully automatic uh, quite regularly when I go up with the kids. Mm. You know, when I go up with the kids, I want to... Um, safe moments as it were mm -hmm. you know with my kids i don't want to be working i don't want to be the photographer you know i want to be the dad yeah i want to take pictures of my totally. kids or the dog or you know absolutely that's the dog again you know um 
And there, I don't want to make the decisions. I have to make these decisions all the time when I take professional headshots and there's none the other. Um, in that instance, I really just want to commit memory. I want to make memories, essentially, right? So they're fully, fully automatic. Totally awesome. Absolutely. No problem at all. I mean, you know, and there are always situations where um, you start, you know, you start to get a little bit more creative. We went for a picnic the other day and um, we were like, we went to this place in the countryside and we were like, had the picnic blanket out and food and everything else. And, you know, my daughter was like lying on the, on the grass and I decided to take, uh, you know, take a picture of her and I kind of, you know, then you start thinking, oh yeah, it would be cool if, you know, that, you know, if I had this, this bit of grass in the foreground and, you know, blow mm -hmm. in the background, of course you, you automatically start thinking like a photographer sometimes, but you know, very often when there's just, you know, when your kids are just doing some goofy things, you just, just want, want to... something to remember. Yeah, right. yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. You know, the other, I don't know if you can remember all those years ago when you very, very first picked up a camera. Mm. How alien did that feel? It feels weird. I thought it was a spy. It's really, it was the oddest thing to just to hold an SLR. It was just, <laughs> this is just yeah. huge. Uh, you don't know what's, where to hold it, how to hold it. And yeah. it just really... Another argument for using program made, auto made, I, just to get used to holding the damn thing. Yeah, because it's very odd. So I remember the, f the first camera that I um, that that used to sort of lie around at home because my, my dad, um, my dad used he was in the photography and everything, and he used to um, have a number of of SLRs um, at home, so film cameras. Mm -hmm. And uh, but the first camera I ever used to play around with was this. I think it was called an Acfamatic. And it was one of these, like, it looked like a spy camera. It was like a brick and it had a red button on it, which was the, the shutter button. And then you take a photo and then you push it together and then it would oh, come out again. Do you remember those? Yeah. Yeah. And they make this really cool sound, like this really awesome, like sci-fi kind of, kind of like a gun, you know, it was like that kind of sound. Nice. And you could get these um, flash cubes to stick on top and there were like four flashes. It's like a cube and it was four flashes. And you could take four pictures with flash and you'd have to change the cube sort of thing. But um, I used to play with this thing all the time because this, the sounds that that thing made were so cool. <laughs> and also, it was like, it almost, it felt like a spy camera, you know, like James Bond. You just go, <laughs> that's cool. <laughs> Loved it. Uh, nice. And then, you know, with, with my dad's SLRs, um, I didn't really understand anything about lenses or anything like that, but they look cool. And it also made a really cool shutter sound. Nice. And then you'd have to, you know, pull the lever to, like the, to just transport the film to be a click. So it's cool. I liked it. Yeah, I do miss the cameras that you used to have to warm up the flash on them. And yeah. And they'll come back. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. They yeah, were awesome. They, they were fun. And then we had a... Oh, I've missed a shot. Oh, all right. <laughs> yeah. I had a Kodomatic, which was Kodak's answer to Polaroid. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, which was... I don't know. It was a cool camera. It was much bigger than a Polaroid for some reason but it was like it like the front bit of the camera flopped out you know like uh like like a really old-fashioned camera it had like one of these um what do you call it? like a what do you call them barrel things whatever you know the kind of leathery what's it called yeah uh do you know what i mean like really let's old. go yeah I yeah I mean, yeah so anyway so it's like you flop it out and you know it was uh you, you put the um the kodak polaroid kind of film in there. Was, mm -hmm. What was it called? It was like a, like a, like a cartridge. And then I can't remember how many pictures you could take, maybe 10 or 12 mm -hmm. or something like that. Mm -hmm. And then of course it was like, like a Polaroid, you press the shutter button and the thing come out and then you'd shake it like a Polaroid picture. And then you'd have, you know, your instant, instant image. Um, and I remember that was, that was like the coolest thing. I got that, I think it was a birthday present when I was like six or something. Wow. That's freaking awesome. And I used to run around. Yeah, it must have been, yeah, it must have been six or seven. Because I remember um, taking pictures at my birthday party, like of my friends with, you know, with this mass. <laughs> I mean, it's the hugest thing. The thing I think that fasc fascinated me the most about these kind of cameras was really like the noises that they made. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, you click the shutter button, there'd be a sound. And then with the Kodomatic, it's like the little motors inside that would push the, the picture out in the end. And it's just. Nice. And they pick us out. Wicked. Nice. And there was like the smell of the chemicals. There's something to be said for, um, you know, film photography 
it's just there's a certain smell to it. Yeah, there is. You know, um, and I can see how people like Polaroid pictures still because it's a thing. You know, mm. there's a lot of people out there like Polaroids. In fact, I was looking at um, the Insta. Is it Instamatic? I'm sure it's Instamatic. Um, little Instamatic printers. Oh, yeah. Fuji make these little yeah. things. Sorry. Um, and you can um, connect them to your camera or you can uh, connect them to your phone, for example, and you can print out you know, instant photos with that. Um, they're very much like Polaroid pictures. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I thought about that because um, I quite like the idea of that. Yeah. People don't print enough these days. They end up sitting on your computer and that's kind of it. Yeah. You know? Do you know what I thought? I thought, um, and I heard somebody else talk about this, uh, which kind of gave me the idea. So it's not really an idea that I had. It's just something I heard and I kind of thought it was a really good idea. Um, I thought about getting one of these printers and, you know, to give an example, like for instance, when I, I, I shoot conferences and, and um, so when, when you shoot a conference, you actually work as part of a team. So mm-hmm. there's, you know, um, they usually videographers there, and then uh, you have the AV team, the audiovisual guys, and you work. You always work. You're constantly working with them because um, typically, what it, what would happen um, at a big conference is you would shoot something, and then there'd be um, there'd be presentations, and then that ask you for shots for presentations and stuff. So you're constantly, yeah. you know, you're handing over images left, right, and center, and everything, and. Um, and so you get to know these people relatively well. And, and very often, um, actually, I meet the same people at, at different conferences. Mm-hmm. So you kind of become friendly with people. And, you know, typically what you do is because you always exchange business cards. Well, it's really kind of boring. So I kind of thought of getting one of these little Instamatic printers. And actually, as part of the whole thing, just take pictures of people. And then at the end of it, just hand them a picture of themselves, like a little portrait. You know, and write my number on the back, and that'd yeah. be my business card. That's not a bad idea. That's a great. I think it's, it's an a awesome way of doing it. Yeah, it's an awesome yeah, idea right? because I, you know, because what would happen is people would, I think they'd be more likely to put that picture on their fridge than yeah. your business card. You know what I mean? Yeah, why not? So, I kind of thought it was a really neat idea. Yeah. And um, so that's why I've been I've been looking into. Nice. Yeah, cool. That's cool, man. It's cool. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Yeah. Someone something different. Yeah, definitely, definitely. You can remember that. So here's another thing, another bit of news um, that came out um, this week. So AP, you know, Associated Press, mm-hmm. they are now, they've now teamed up with Sony. Okay. Which doesn't necessarily seem that amazing, but it kind of is because um, the one thing that Sony's been lacking um, is that kind of association with press photography. Mm. You know, yeah. Nikon and Canon, they've built up this reputation over decades of being like, you know, the, the press photographer's first choice. You know, uh, for instance, Nikon have over decades have, have uh, built up you know, this reputation of being solid, indestructible kind of cameras that are very often used by war photographers, for example. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, and of course, Canon, um, you know, a lot of press photographers use Canons famously um you know susa uh, barack obama's uh, photographer used canons and so on and so forth so um so these are these two brands have have kind of gained that um what's the word that sort of i was like superior brand image by by being associated with, you know, press photography. And it gives them, it just adds that kind of weight to it. Um, but Sony, that's something that's eluded Sony so far. And yeah. of course, Sony, Sony are now, you know, Sony is now, um, it's one of the big three now. You know, they're, they're not a small player at all. You know, in fact, in, ma- in many ways, you could say they've overtaken, you know, mm-hmm. Nikon mm-hmm. and um, they've been hot on the heels of Canon, you know, for years now. Um, and, now AP as the Associated Press have now teamed up with Sony and they're now buying a whole bunch of A9s for their photographers and some of the latest A7s. So it's for, for some of the like videographers. So they're really kidding out their photographers with Sony cameras. Um, and there's a number of reasons for that. One of the reasons 
um, that AP stated was that uh, Sony's are, are capable of, because they're mirrorless, they're capable of uh, shooting silently, yeah. which is a great advantage, as you can imagine. Yeah, as a press photographer, being in a press conference and being able to shoot silently, that's great. We won't, you know, we won't be hearing in the future. I think we won't be hearing all these camera clicks going on. Yeah, you know, yeah. in the background. So, so that's phenomenal. The other thing was um, was compatibility, because mm-hmm. up to now. Uh, AP photographers have been pretty much left to their own devices as to what their own preference was. So some were shooting Nikon, some were shooting Canon. And if you've got everyone shooting Sony, then there's a lot of compatibility so people can, you know, exchange lenses and everything will work together and the whole rest of it. So those are two of the two of the main reasons. But I just thought that was interesting for um, AP to uh, to go with Sony on that. It is. I yeah. uh, obviously, I'm guessing they're getting a pretty fantastic deal, but it's a shrewd move by Sony. Yeah, I think AP is not small. <laughs> no, true, and I think it'll you know it'll really add to to Sony's of reputation. Yeah, you know, and um, yeah. So I think that's you know clearly, yeah, yeah. clearly well. well. The other the other news, um, photo news I came across this week was, um, you know, Rankin, mm-hmm. right? So Rankin is. A very famous British photographer, uh, famous for a number of well, X amount of different things. Um, you know, he's been very uh, successful in advertising, um, portrait photography. Uh, he's also um, a music video director yeah. and so on and so forth. So, um, so he's done a lot of stuff um, and without doubt is, is a very, you know, world renowned photographer. So he has gone and basically photographed 12 NHS workers, uh, people who were um, instrumental in, you know, during the whole coronavirus crisis. So he's decided that um, he was going to go and do and take take portraits of, of of 12 NHS. So that includes, um, you know, ICU specialists, um, nurse, um, uh, uh, like ambulance driver, for example, or um, uh, a call responder or something, you know, Mm -hmm. people like that. And, you know, and I read this and I thought, oh, wow, that's really cool. You know, and it's basically to to draw attention to the importance of those um, of those people and the roles that they played in you know, in this, in this crisis. And again, you know, I, I read about it and I kind of thought, wow, this is, uh, this is amazing. Great. You know, awesome. Um, th- and I saw some sort of behind the scenes photos, uh, where you could see how he did it. And yeah, basically, you know, a sheet of plastic with a little slit cut into it. And he was like photographing, um, his subjects in front of a white background, um, just you know, shooting through this slit in the, in the plastic. So it was kind of pretty safe environment, I would say. Um, and I thought, wow, this is like a really good idea. It's great, you know, fantastic way of, of drawing attention to them. Um, and then I saw the final photos. Okay. And to say I wasn't very impressed. Well, why is, is that? Well, because I didn't really feel that they were very special. Okay. You know. Um, and this is like I'm not taking I'm, I'm not taking away anything from the people and the sentiment and the idea and the important the message of 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 this you know I'm, I'm not taking away from that at all because I do I do think it's a great project and it's a mm-hmm. great idea mm-hmm. and I think you know having somebody of that caliber. Um, because I mean, let's face it. You know, if, if I had done the same thing, it wouldn't have been as, um, you know, it wouldn't have had the same sure, 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 kind sure. Of worth, you know. Um, so I thought, you know, I, I love, I, I love everything around it. It's just that I don't really love the final images. What was what? Uh, what did they lack? For want of a better word, I don't know. They were quite bland. Okay. In my view, you know, and it's um, of course we'll, we'll put the link on the. Um, 
on our Facebook page and people can can have a look for themselves. And and again, I'm not, you know, I almost feel bad for saying it because I really want to, I want to love these images. Did he but, mm. go into any detail anywhere and talk about why he took them the way that he took them? Um, I'm just wondering if that perhaps it was a, I'm sure it was a conscious decision to knowing right. who he is and what his work is like, right? Mm. I'm sure he's done it deliberately. And um, perhaps he's taken the, he's left the images as bland as possible so that the, there is only one focus and that is the person that's in the image. Maybe that was a take on it. I don't, mm. I don't know. But then you can do that and still make the images look special, right? You make that person look special. Yeah, I mean, it's just, this is exactly, I think this is the sort of issue I had with them is that they didn't, the images didn't, you know, they didn't seem that special other than who they were depicted. And may, maybe this was the whole point is actually to just reduce it down to who it was rather yeah. than any, any, any fluff. And maybe that's, you know, um, and if that's the case, awesome. Um, but I don't know. I mean, you know, and again, this is completely and utterly subjective. Sure, yeah, sure. It's very, I mean, actually this, this really just kind of reminds me of what we're talking about. Um, you know, one or two episodes ago, the, the whole Annie Leibovitz um, mm, kind of, yeah. you know, drama. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, do you remember we said at a time that ultimately it boils down to whether you like the photograph or not, you know, and obviously there were a lot of people who didn't like her artistic take on it. No. Because remember the criticism was um, the skin tones weren't right and the color was flat and blah, blah. And, you know, on one hand, you can say, well, but that's her style. And especially recently, it's just, you know, for the last few years or something, that's just been her style. She's, there's nothing in the photo that's not in keeping with her style. So actually, as far as that's concerned, she's yeah. done exactly what you'd expect her to do. Sure. Um, and, and, you know, it, it was just simply a matter of whether you like it or you don't. And if you don't, cool, you just don't. And so I think that's where I am with, the, with these ranking photos is I just don't like the style. I think that's, you know, with that, and again, I just have to stress that I'm not taken away from the meaning and the sentiment and the, and all of that. I, I just don't like the photos. It doesn't sound like it's in keeping with his typical style to me. Uh, probably not. I mean, not not from what I know of his work, but um, but then maybe again, maybe that was the creative decision. You know? Yeah, I'm um, sure it was. I'm sure yeah. it was, and I'm sure there was also limitations in how he could set up and what he could set up and what he could change. Yeah, and, it yeah, seemed yeah, like, yeah, I mean, yeah. the, the setup was very, very basic. I mean, from what I've seen, you know, it was literally like a, a single light portrait, you know, a single soft box. There was no big, mm. there, was, there was nothing um, elaborate about the shoot whatsoever. I mean, yeah. it's very, very simple uh, thing. It's, yeah, I mean, it's just one of these things. I don't know. Um, so, but that's that's how that's how it goes with art. Sometimes you know yeah, it's absolutely. it is subjective, and sometimes you love it, and sometimes you don't. Um, you I, th know. I think we said it in the last episode or two. It's it's a bit like your favorite band. You know, you get in someone when their first album comes out, perhaps their second album as well, and they go into that yeah. elusive third and fourth album that just goes in a yeah. different direction because they're album. trying something new and creative. Yeah, and it might be a few too many steps away from why you got into them in the first place. Yeah, you know, and that's okay. That's true. And, you know, also, I mean, as a musician, of course, you know, you know that um, you, you also don't want to be branded with the same thing because I think the last thing anybody would ever want to do is to just repeat themselves all the time. Yeah. And so, yeah. you know, so I do like it actually when, when photographers change their style over time. And I think, you know, and again, in danger of repeating myself, but as far as like, if we just take any leave of it as an example, then over time, you can see how her style has changed. And so when you look at some of the mm -hmm. very early stuff, that's very different from the most recent stuff. And I like it, you know, because I do like her early, early stuff almost just as much as I really dig her more mm -hmm. contemporary stuff. But, as, mm -hmm. you know, but I can see how just like in music, for instance, you know, what's a good example? Jim Miroquai is a good example. I mean, you know, first couple of albums, awesome. Then it went a bit, yeah. And then after that, it went like, what is he doing? Yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, 
and he still owes me a mobile phone. So, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so um, yeah, so it's again totally subjective. So let's talk about our photo competition this month, which is landscape. Oh, and which f-stop are you going to use for landscape? Something very small. And of course, by saying that, we mean a big number. A big number. Yeah. Exactly. Indeed. Yeah. Indeed. Yeah. So, um, so what did we forget to do? We forgot to put the competition on Facebook. Yeah. Yeah, we did. Um, well, I did. So, oops. <laughs> oops. As a consequence, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to um, extend the deadline yeah. to the 16th of August. Yeah. I think, yeah. I think it's so, only fair. That's only fair. That's true. So the uh, so the July competition deadline is actually going to be the sixteenth of August. Um, and remember, it's landscapes, so it could be any kind of landscape. In fact, it could be any kind of scape. It could be a seascape or a net, absolutely netscape. Is that still a thing? It, it's one of the first browsers I used to, used at work. Does it still exist? I don't think so. Do you know it's the first tabbed browser? Oh, really? Yeah, yeah it was long before Firefox. Hmm. Yeah, I think I remember um, when Internet Explorer first introduced tabs. I think that's pretty much the same point. It started collapsing. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, I mean, I used to. I, I remember. I used to think like tabs. Why would anybody want tabs? What's yeah, the point? Quite. You know. No, and now, hundred yeah, well, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, Netscape, man, that takes me back. Yeah. Incredible. Yeah. So. Netscape. Well, well, landscape. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a long day. Yes. Um, so, uh, competition. What people don't realize is that we are currently recording a double episode. So we've been doing this for like six hours. Yeah. <laughs> That's because I decided to take a few days off next week. Yeah. Where are you going to go? Naughty. Devon. Devon. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. About half an hour from the beach or so. All right, let's go. Cool. From the coast, north coast of Devon. Nice. Going down with a couple of friends and just try and relax. Awesome. Be a bit more normal for a while. Cool. Can you can you go to the beach now, or is it like what what is the are there any yeah. restrictions? Or? Oh, um, yeah, probably. Mm. Um, I've not really looked into it too much of it, mm. but we just got a nice kind of big cottage and whatnot, and just okay. got a couple of acres of land with a big pond in. Very very nice. Cool. Nice. Do nothing. Yeah. Type of week. Perfect. Yeah. Very cool. much needed. Cool. I'm going to be uh, doing nothing with the dog. <laughs> Technically, this will be the, the, the second of the double episodes. So this is the first mention of the dog in this one, well, probably. So. That's it. Yeah. Anyway, uh, talking about dogs, landscapes. Yeah. Um, so, competition deadline is the 16th of August. Yeah. Um, you can enter any kind of landscape. Uh, it could be landscape, it could be a seascape, it could actually be any scape for that matter. Um, and where can they be entered? You can enter, you can either enter them via email. So you could send them to cameraShakePodcast at gmail.com mm -hmm. or you could just send them via Facebook or just post them on our Facebook um, page. So that's um, facebook.com forward slash cameraShakePodcast. So we've come to the end of episode 15 of the Camera Shake podcast. I hope you enjoyed it um, and we'll see you again next Thursday. Take it easy until then. Bye. See ya.